Good morning, Sister Cunningham. Can you hear me? Good morning. Are there others who can hear me so that I can know that I can be heard and the sound is working? Great. Welcome to the Saturday morning breakfast Bible study. I'm so glad that all of you have joined us this morning. Um, this is the Patton Memorials Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, and I am Pastor Lydia Spragan. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you so much for sending your son Jesus the Christ into the world. And we thank you so much, Father God, for your word. Now, Father God, send your Holy Spirit that he may teach us what he would have us to know. In Jesus' name, we do pray. Amen. Good morning. Um, today, I would like to uh, begin by uh, talking about last week's Bible study. I go back and I review every uh, Bible study, every sermon that I teach or preach. And every once in a while, I hear something and I say, hmm, is that right? And then I go back and I look at it. So I, I listened at it last week and I said, hmm, that does not sound right. And I looked back at the Facebook uh, comments to see if anybody else caught it. Now, last week's Bible study was viewed about 260 times or more, and I would have thought that somebody would have put in the comments, uh, Pastor, uh, did you make a mistake? But I did not see that. Now, I want us to go back and, and listen. I usually say, study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word. Okay, when I talk about study, I don't just mean theologically study. I mean factually study the Bible as well. Um, last week, I said uh, something about the 321 fish. Now, as soon as I said it, my brain immediately said, that may not be quite right. And in fact, my brain said, that's not quite right. So I said, okay. And I looked it up and I saw what it was. I was hoping also that someone else would have caught that and said, I know that's not quite right. There's only one place that I know of in the Bible where the number of fish that they actually caught is told. And that is in John, the 21st chapter. Let's go there for a moment. I'll come back and teach on it in a couple of weeks. But I just want us to look at it for a moment right now. John, the 21st chapter. And let us begin with the first verse. After these things, and I'm reading from the King James Version. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore. 
but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he girt his fish's coat unto him, for he was naked. And he did cast himself into the sea. And the other disciples came in a little ship, for they were not far from land, but as it were, 200 cubits, dragging the net with fishes. As soon as they were come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid thereon and bread. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to, the, to land, full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Now, uh, verse 12 and 14, just so we can finish the story. Jesus said unto them, Come and dine, and none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. This is how the, now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Now, here it tells us exactly how many fish were caught. 153. Why does that matter? Because I believe that every single word in the Bible is there for a reason. And this is where God mentions the number of fish that was caught. Is there any significance to the number 153? Why would they say the number instead of saying many fish? And they make a point to tell you this number, I would say, for a reason. This is how I know that every single word in the Bible is important. Every single word we have to believe. Now, last week when I said 321, and nobody caught it. I hope that's because nobody didn't know this scripture. You just didn't want to say that it should have been 153. I tell my members when I preach or teach to take notes, to go home, study for themselves. Sometimes when I preach, my members will ask for my sermons or my teaching notes. And I will just hand it to them. Sometimes I have multiple copies because I expect them to ask for a copy of this sermon or a copy of the teaching notes. And when I do, every single sermon, or let me say 90% of them, are documented. Where, did, where I found it, where the references are. Uh, if I got it from the internet, the link from the internet. If I got it from a book I was reading, the name of the book and the author. Uh, if there's a cross reference or a passage that I'm relying on for that particular part of the sermon, I have those particular references there. Why do I do that? Because I don't want you to just take my word for it. I want you to know it for yourself. I want you to know the Bible factually, and I want you to know it theologically, and I want you to know what you believe. And I want you to know what you believe because I want you to be able to contend for the faith. Give reasons why you believe what you believe. And if somebody says to you, uh, that's, that's, not, uh, that's not correct, ask them why. 
My question in most of my studies is where in the Bible is that found? Because I want to know if you are able to contend for the faith. You have to know the Bible, not only uh, just read the words. You have to know the Bible. Now, you're not going to know all of these books in and out. That's impossible. But there ought to be one gospel that you know, that you know, that you know. There ought to be at least one uh, book of history or the church history of Acts that you know, that you know, that you know. There ought to be at least one letter that you can sink your teeth into and know that you know that you know that letter. It's important because sometimes people will come to you with questions and they will ask you, why'd you say that? Or where is that found? Or uh, how do you know that? And it opens the door and gives you an opportunity to witness to somebody. It gives you that. They invite you then to open your Bible and point out to them the bases of your belief. Something as simple as 321 fishes versus 153 fishes is important. Why? Because the number 153 means something. It stands for something in the Bible. And you ought to know what it stands for. Why didn't there, why wasn't there some other number that was used? John is one of those gospels that I study. And when I got to that passage of scripture, and I found that number 153. The first question was, why here? Did God take the time and have the disciples to take the time to count the number of fish and tell us exactly how many there were? And my brain started turning. And saying, what could this number mean? I'm going to ask you that question. What does the number 153 mean? Why is it important that God took the time to write it? And why is it important that we keep it accurate? Now I'm going to answer all those questions in about two or three weeks. I want to give you time to, to, to look at it, study it, see what it means. The other reason why you want to study both factually and theologically and be able to can't contend for the faith is because there are people out there who take the Bible and they twist it to mean whatever it is that they want it to mean. And if you don't know you can be led astray. That's how cults get started. That people uh, believe what the people tell them. And they don't go back and study for themselves to show themselves approved, question what it is that they are hearing. You say, well, I'm not supposed to question God. People in the Bible question God all the time. God gives them answers to their questions. And sometimes it even raises more questions. Our thoughts are not like God's thoughts. And our ways are not like God's ways. God tells us, get understanding. And sometimes in order for us to get understanding, we've got to ask some questions and sometimes we ourselves don't know the answer so the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit 
will lead us and guide us, teach us. Who knows the mind of God like the Spirit of God? That's why I invite him to teach the Bible study. Because I don't know it all. And I don't know what it is that he may want us to learn today. I've prepared something. And I've, but I want the Holy Spirit to teach it. Let's turn to the book of Jude. Jude, the book right before Revelation. Now, last week I made some references to Peter, Second Peter, First um, Peter, and I'm going to tie them in with Jude today, and Second um, Peter and Jude, and I'm going to tie them in this way. One very interesting aspect of the links between 2 Peter and Jude is that 2 Peter 1.10 says, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling, underline the word calling, and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fail. Underline, ye shall never fail. That's in 2 Peter 1.10. And that verse frames the epistle of Jude. Jude opens with addressing those who are called and ends with the promise that he is able to keep you from falling. So let's look at Jude a little bit closer. From who? Jude a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Now Jude was an elder in the church. And if you, um, I didn't teach it here, but when we first started out this uh, Bible study on how to teach the, how to uh, study the Bible, we started by looking at the order of the books in the Bible. And we learned that there were two orders that are uh, basically prominent in the Bible. The traditional order, uh, which we see usually in our table of contents, and then the inspired order. Um, the inspired order is uh, based on Jesus, where he says, um, the the I have come and to talk about the prophets, the writings, they talk of me. And he splits the Old Testament into three sections. And in those three sections, um, they combine certain books and you end up with 22 books, which is the number of Hebrew um, alphabet in the Old Testament versus 39 books in our traditional setting. There's also an order to the New Testament. And what we learn is the books, James, followed by Peter, followed by John and Jude, indicate eldership from highest to lowest in the Bible. So James was the leader of the church, followed by Peter, followed by John, followed by Jude. So Jude is one of the elders of the church, and he is writing. And who is he writing to? Verse, he says, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Jude is writing not to non-believers, 
but Jude is writing to the believers, those who are called, beloved, and kept for Jesus Christ. He's writing to the Jewish Christians living in Jerusalem. And he first says to them, mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. What a greeting. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Then he goes on to tell us about the purpose of the writing. He says, beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, Jude explains that he had initially intended to write about something else. He had initially intended to write a general letter of encouragement on the topic of the salvation we share. Instead, he says, I felt the necessity to write to you, appealing that you do what? Contend earnestly for the faith. He says, I've changed my mind about what, what is most important that I write about. Right now, I don't need to write to you about the salvation that we share. I need to write to you how important it is that we contend for the faith and contend earnestly for the faith. Now, Jude is concerned because the faith, the Christian message of the gospel is under attack. And he wants to make sure that while it is under attack, that we know we who call ourselves Christians, believers, the called, those that are kept by Jesus Christ, that we know what it is that we believe so that when people come and attack us, attack the church, that we might be able to contend for the faith. Now, that's important. So important that he spends this entire book giving us rationale as to why we should contend from the faith. And he says, we are under attack from false teachers who are spreading dangerous heresies or dangerous beliefs. Jude urges his readers <coughs> to contend for the faith against those who seek to undermine and erode it. The Greek word Jude cho chooses, translated, contend earnestly usually describes an athlete striving with extreme intensity to win the victory in a physical competition. Remember now, what does Ephesians 6 say? We wrestle not against flesh and blood. So while it is describing a physical competition, we should keep in mind that this is a spiritual warfare that we are engaged in and we need to be able to contend for the faith we need to be able to stand up and speak out about what it is that god wants us to be able to share with those who do not know him and we need to be able to speak up and stand out stand up and say to those who are not teaching the right thing that brothers, sisters, that's not correct. That's not correct. Remember one of the reasons that the, that the word is here is for correction. And we need to know the word in order to know when we are hearing it correctly. We need to know it factually, and we need to know theologically what it is that we believe about God, what it is that we believe about the Bible, what it is that we believe about faith, 
when somebody comes up and says, uh, that's not right. Don't say, yes, it is. Ask them why. And show me in the Bible where you are basing your belief. And they should be able to pick up the Bible and say, right here it says. And you should be able to pick up the Bible and say, right here it says. The, the Amplified Bible translates the command contend earnestly as fight strenuously for the defense of the faith. That means this is not going to be easy. You're going to have to struggle with the text. You're going to have to work with the text so that when somebody comes to you and challenges what you believe, that you don't get all huffed up and puffed up. You can wait. You can listen because you know where uh, you stand. And there's no shame in your game to say to somebody, I don't know, but I'm going to go study that. And when I find the answer, I'm going to come back and let you know. Because you need to know where uh, you stand in the faith. You need to be rooted and grounded. Otherwise, if you're not rooted and grounded in what you believe, you're going to be swayed by any old wind that comes by. And you'll be tempted to move in this direction and move in that direction. But if you are rooted and grounded, you'll be able to stand. The, the Bible says like a tree planted by the water. You'll be able to stand and say, this is what I believe and why. And don't argue with the folk. You just present the rationale. Let them go back and struggle with the text. Struggle with the rationale. And study to show themselves approved. So that they will have a clear understanding of what they believe. So that they can pass it on to somebody else. That's why uh, uh, it's important, you know, uh, to me, that we know how or what to share as the gospel. If we don't have nothing else that we should be able to share and contend for the faith, we should know the gospel and how to share it with someone else. That is to contend for our faith. Because Jude says that we have a, a, later in the passage, that we have a duty to snatch people from the fire. And if we can snatch at least one, we will have done our job. But I hope that we are able to snatch more than one. Jude wants all believers to contend earnestly for the faith. A true contender vigorously endeavors to win the competition, not holding anything back. In this case, the struggle is for the faith, which is the saving truth of Jesus Christ and his teachings. Now let's look at that. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians. Uh, the 11th chapter. Verse 3 through 4. Are you there? Good. But I would have you know. Circle the word know. I would have you know. That the head of every man is Christ. And the head of of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head 
covered dishonoreth the head. Now I know this is a controversial verse because a lot of us say, I don't want no man to be in charge of me. It did not say be in charge of you. It said, and the head of every man is Christ. You know, when people get up and they testify and they say, a giving honor to God who is the head of my life. To me, that's the greatest testimony that somebody can give. But then I also look at that person closely. Because if they're standing up and they're testifying he is the head of their life, that means that they don't take any actions or do anything that isn't like God. They consult him in everything. Uh, some of you know that I often wear uh, a black bracelet on my hand. And it used to have words imprinted in it or, or letters that said WWJD. What would Jesus do? And uh, I took this bracelet at the time that I was reading a book called In His Steps by Charles Sheldon. And the book challenged the people inside that for a year that they would commit themselves to doing what Jesus would do. No matter what it cost them, they would do what Jesus would do. They would take that particular action and suffer the consequences. Um, I decided to take the challenge as well for a year uh, earlier in my life. And I said, what would Jesus do? Sometimes the things that Jesus would have me do would be so contrary to my nature. I did not want to do it. But he is the head of my life. And as long as he is following God with that type of attitude, remember God uh, sent his only begotten son and allowed himself uh, to be crucified on a cross, sacrificed for us. If the man or the husband that I have is so following God that he is willing to have him as the head of his life doing what he believes that God has called him to do sacrificially and willing to give his life for me in my place. I don't have no trouble with that man being the head of my life because he's the head of me, the Bible says, and God is the head of him, which means God is the head of both of us. And I believe God is in control. He is sovereign. So, when we look here, he said, but I would have you know. There are some things that we ought to know. That we ought to be able to, to, to actually know the truth of. First uh, Thessalonians, the second and third, second chapter. First Thessalonians. The second chapter. Again, you don't have to agree with me. Struggle with the text for yourself and see what answer you come up with. First Thessalonians, the second chapter and the 13th verse. I apologize. Oh. I'll cut this off. Oh. 1 Thessalonians, the second chapter and the 13th verse. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, 
which ye heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Now, when you hear the word of God preached unto you, I turn this all the way down. I don't know why it's still going off. Let me just turn the phone off. Okay, I apologize again. Um, when you have the word of God being taught to you, we are using ourselves as channels to hear from God. We realize a lot of times when we get up to preaching after we have studied that we, that didn't come from us. That was not our mind. And hopefully we have spent enough time with God during the week for God to speak to us so that we can have a word for you. And we can rely upon the fact that God's word is not void. God's word is not void. It will not return unto him void, which means that every time we open our mouths, God is going to use us to say something to somebody that they're going to get something out of it that is going to be a benefit unto them. Okay. So we have to realize that it's not men who are writing this book, even though it is. If this book is written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and it is God's word, and we have to accept it as God's word. And that is one of the bases of contending for the faith. How do you know that it is God's word? Sometimes you just have to say, it says so. It says so. And leave it at that. It says so is enough. Hebrews 1 and 2. Hebrews, the first chapter, and the first verse, says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. God, this same God that we were introduced to in Genesis 1, where it says, in the beginning, God, this same God, God, who at times past spoke through prophets. Okay, we can, we know that. History tells us that there were men who came and, and spoke as prophets. They foretold things. And the Bible tells us how to tell if the prophet is real or speaking something true, and how to tell if the prophet is false and speaking something that is not true. The Bible tells us that if it is coming to pass, if it comes to pass, then the prophet's words were true. If it does not come to pass, then the prophet's words were false. Now, how many times do we have people stand up and say, I'm going to prophesy over you? Okay. If your words come to pass, then you are a true prophet. If your words do not come to pass, then you are not a true prophet. You go get a million dollars. Did it come? If it didn't come, then it was a false prophecy from a false prophet. Uh, so when we talk about contending for the faith, we have to know, we have to believe, and we have to understand 
that this is God speaking. This is God speaking. And it says, and, and which was once for all handed down to the saints. He said, since this faith was entrusted to God's holy people, all believers, not just Christian leaders, are called to defend the truth of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we say, that's not my job. I don't need to be able to defend the faith. You know, that's the pastor's job. Or that's the Sunday school teacher's job. Or that's the president of the missionary's job. No, 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 no. It's everybody's job to be able to defend the faith. Okay? It's written to all believers, not just the leaders, but everybody. Since this faith was entrusted once for all, Jude intends to stand against those who claim to receive new revelations of truth. Okay. Uh, God said to me last night, that's a new revelation of truth. And how do we know that it's a new revelation of truth? Because we know the truth. We know the truth because we have studied it and we know what it says. And we have the Holy Spirit guiding us into all truth. So we know the truth and we know what we believe. Okay. Through Jesus Christ's personal teachings and the work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus has already given the full meaning of truth to the apostles. How do we know that? Let's look at John, the 14th chapter and the 26th verse. And I'm talking about the gospel now of John. John, the 14th chapter and the 26th verse says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, some translations say Holy Spirit, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you how many things? All things. And bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Spirit is there to teach you what? All things. If you don't understand something, and you sit down and you ask God about it. You need to believe that God is going to send the Holy Spirit. Well, you can ask God, God, can you send your Holy Spirit to please help me understand this passage of scripture or this verse or this word or how it applies to my life? And God has already promised here that he will teach you. He shall teach you all things. That's a promise. And bring all things to your remembrance. That's a promise. God cannot lie. People don't need to come up with new revelations. God says he will send his Holy Spirit to teach you. Not some, not a part, but all things. Let's turn to John, stay in John, the 16th chapter, and go to the 12th verse. And here we find these words. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come. He will, here's another promise, he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you into all truth. You don't need nobody else to bring you a new revelation. The Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear. Who's he listening to? Who is having a conversation that he is listening to? God is having a conversation with Jesus, the word of God. 
And you might say, well, I don't really understand that. Okay, study on it. But to suffice it to say that God and Jesus are different personalities. God is the judge and Jesus is the savior. He's the advocate, the one who is going to be our advocate when the uh, accuser of the brethren come. And God and Jesus uh, as persons, as we understand it, talk to each other. Jesus speaks. He is the word. God is a judge. The Holy Spirit primary role is as a teacher and the Bible is telling us that he will teach what he shall hear. He can only hear it from two sources, God and Jesus the Christ. So what he is teaching you is the truth because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And the Bible tells us that God cannot lie. So either one of those two sources, God or Jesus, is going to be the truth. So he shall, whatsoever he shall hear. So if he's in the presence of God and he hears it and he speaks it, it's the truth. If he's in the presence of Jesus and he hears it and he speaks it, it's the truth. If he's in the presence of God and Jesus, seated at the right hand of God the Father is Jesus the Christ. If he's in their presence and he hears it and he speaks it, it's the truth. Whatsoever he shall hear. That means he doesn't really think of things to tell you himself. He's telling you what he has heard. You know, that gives me great comfort because when I hear the Holy Spirit come to me when I'm in times of, of trial and tribulation and in, uh, caught up in everything that could go wrong, is going wrong, when it, when it comes to uh, listening and hearing the Holy Spirit and he whispers, it's going to be all right. I know he can't speak nothing but what he has already heard and he can only speak the truth he can't lie so when he says it's going to be all right no matter what it looks like to me i can believe it's all right because he said so but but whatsoever he shall hear that shall he speak and he will show you things to come Look, the Holy Spirit is going to show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and he shall show it unto you. He shall. That's a promise. Show it unto you. So you don't need no new revelation from anybody else, because if you ask God, he will send the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will show you himself what is to come. The Holy Spirit himself will speak to you what he's already heard about the subject. You can get the truth for yourself. Uh, my brain is saying, so why go to church? You don't go to church to, to, to uh, you go to church to fellowship and assemble yourselves together to encourage one another. You go to church to worship God in spirit and in truth. You go to church to hear what thus saith the Lord through the man or woman of God. You take notes on it. You write it down so that when you go home, you can be berean and study for yourself to see if what they say is true. Jude tells us uh, that we have to be aware 
of what it is that we are hearing. The Holy Spirit that lives inside of us should be leading and guiding our mind as to how we receive things and how we discern things as whether it is true or not. Paul gives a similar warning not to let anyone pervert the gospel of Christ with new and different teachings. Where is this? In Galatians. Galatians. The first chapter. And the sixth verse. Look at what it says. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Paul says, listen, I'm just amazed that you, that somebody have been able to take you away from the good news that you know, that you know or that you ought to know is the truth. Which is not which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and will pervert the gospel of Christ. There would be some that would pervert it, twist it around, mean what they want it to mean. To, 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 to lead you in a way that is, is against what God really intended. It says, but through though we are an angel from heaven. Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that which ye have received, let him be accursed. Well, in order to know you have to know what the gospel is that you have received. What is the good news? That Jesus came. That Jesus died. First of all, he lived. Jesus came. Jesus lived. Jesus died. Why? So that we would not have to die in our sins. Jesus died in our place. He died. He became the sacrifice. He was dead. He was buried. But he did not stay dead and buried. He arose from the dead. The conqueror over sin and death in order that we might have life, have it more abundantly, and have it eternally. That's good news. That's the gospel. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That's what we believe. And that's what we got to be able to defend or contend. Contend for the faith. Okay. Why? For certain persons have crept in unnoticed. Note, this is why it is important that we watch and pray. We can't just keep our eyes closed. Certain persons will creep in unnoticed. We have to watch and pray. Those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons, who turned the grace of our God into licentiousness 
and deny our only master and Lord, Jesus the Christ. Now, it's almost time for me to go. So the word licentiousness, I want you to take the time, look that word up, get a good understanding of what that word means. For they turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our only master and Lord Jesus the Christ. These people have crept in unawares. Now we need to wake up, open our eyes, watch and pray and see who these people really are and what they are really teaching and why we should not believe it and how we should combat it. We have to be so equipped that we can contend for the faith. Now I'm going to pick up right there next week. You have two pieces of homework. The first one is to look up this word licentiousness, L-I-C-E-N-T-I-O-U-S-N-E-S-S. -E -S -S. Again, that's L-I-C-E-N-T-I-O-U-S-N-E-S-S. SS. Look up that word. Study that word. Determine what that word means and how it applies to you. Secondly, your homework is to try to figure out where or why the number 153 is used in that particular passage and why it was important that the disciples count the number of fish and what does that mean to us who now read that number why should we get excited about it now given the pace that I'm going right now uh, with contending for the faith, it'll be a couple of minutes before I can get to the number 153. But I, I will get to it, I promise. I've already printed out the lesson on it, and I'm going to staple it to this so that when I get to the end of this lesson, I will know that that's what I'm supposed to teach next so that I don't forget. Let us pray. Gracious God, please help us. Send your Holy Spirit. Teach us what he would have us know. And then, Father God, we know that he can only teach us what he has heard, revealed to us, bring us into all understanding of. Once we understand, Father God, what it is that he is teaching us, help us to apply it to our lives in such a way that it becomes a part of us, that we walk it out, that we talk it out, that we live it out, so that our lives will become a living Bible to those who are around us. So that somebody will stop and inquire, why is it that you smile even when things are going bad? Why is it that you serve God? Why is it that you go to church every Sunday? Why is it that you always on your knees and praying? Why is it? 
that you always giving thanks to God in everything, no matter what happens. That we will be able to give a good report and a good answer to them who ask and raise the questions about what it is that we believe. Help us, Father, to become good, even great contenders for the faith. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. We'll be back here on next Saturday at the same time in the same place, and we hope that you will too. And until then, be safe. Practice social distancing. Wear your mask and pray. Amen. Praise God. Have a great day. And remember, God loves you, and so do I.